to particularly ex express our our appreciation for the way you have put some of us together so that two churches of the same size can share their experiences and their their joys and, and their struggles and frustrations. Now we ask that you make us aware, that is so critical, make us aware of the people that want to hear your story and then put them in our lives and put the words in our mouths. Amen. Amen. All righty, let me go ahead and if you'll mute yourself, I'll go ahead and share screen. Uh, always do that backwards. Come on, get out of there. All righty. Are you seeing a little message box on your screen? No, good, because I can't seem to get rid of it. Okay, I, I always like to step back anytime we're doing something like this and, and look back at the fundamentals. What are, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Because that's what determines all the various steps. And so we'll do the quick review of our goals and ask why it is we have to go to all this trouble. Why don't people love us so much that they're just coming dashing into our doors and overflowing our views? And then ask kind of the reverse of that, that since people don't like us, do we have any real potential to reach people? And then finally look at the overall process, the final part of the quick review. And then on detailed discussions, we're going to look at what activities should we have? How can we make, uh, how can we make ourselves comfortable while they, make them comfortable while they are with us? And then a few, I always have final thoughts because there's always something I think of as we're going through. All right, why are you? Come on, computer. There we go. Yeah. Okay, some fi foundational thoughts. What we're going to be talking about is the various events and activities we put on, and I'll use those two words interchangeably. Um, and that applies both to our standard Sunday morning worships services, but also all other events and activities, be they in person or online. And we'll distinguish those. There's some really interesting things we can do with online events. Um, and the key for all of this, if you stop and think about it, it sounds a little strange, but it's really true that the key, the number one thing is that the guests be comfortable. If they're not comfortable, now defining that word is hard, but I think you get my impression. If, if they're feeling a lot of discomfort, it doesn't matter what else we do. We're not gonna break through the resistance. Our guests should leave thinking this is a friendly group of people, that's absolutely true. But being friendly is just not enough. So, and we'll, we'll talk about this next one in a little more detail in a few minutes. But what I'm going to suggest to you is you pick three to five themes about your church. And, and, and the phrase I'll use over and over and over again is tell your story. You want people to know who you are. Tell your story. So pick a couple. And I think now, the more I think about it, I think five is probably too much. Um, I think probably two or three things you want people to know about your church. And for example, it could be, um, we love our kids. And surely note that's where the path, the uh, typo is, will you? I couldn't find it again. Um, that this world is actually God's and we seek to care for it. And when we say all are welcome, we mean all. And that's an important one because lots of churches say we are all are welcome. But, you know, you wonder if that's actually true. All that said, though, most people won't retain a lot of information. I've shown you several times a page of negatives that if you can't, if you can't find it, let me know. You know, no problem at all. Um, and the, the thing to do, and I think this would be a great coffee hour or small group, even vestry event, you know, for a few minutes, maybe do it two or three times over months. Um, one of the things it says is that... <coughs> Churches are not welcoming of other people or they're judgmental. Well, ask people 
Spe- don't we, we can't just announce to the world we are not judgmental. That doesn't get us anywhere. We've got to somehow be able to say this is how we show we live into the fact we're not judgmental. So this would be a great little project to have. I can see uh, post-it notes, that, that little game you have them up on the wall and you put post-it notes up and say, here's what we do that show we are not judgmental. Now, a lot of them, we may not be doing something specific we can point to some of these negatives, but there will be a couple. Back to the fact you're trying to find two or three themes, not everything in the world. Um, remember, and, and this, you know, I'll keep, keep harping on, you have about a half a second to get their attention and then three to five seconds to influence them. And you probably remember I said that's, that's like the headline of the newspaper and the first paragraph. If you want them to read the whole story, you got to get them interested in the headline so they'll read the first paragraph and then keep on reading on. And we've got to remember that. We don't have time to, to use a lot of words. So our goal is not to increase attendance or budget, mainly because Jesus never said anything about that. Our goal is to help other people grow closer to God. And if we do that, if we show God's love, if they, if they see God's love in us, it's very likely that our average Sunday attendance and our budget will improve. So that's a nice fringe benefit, if you will. I am sorry. I don't know what is going, what is in this house today, but I just cannot stop coughing. Uh, I don't think it's anything, you know, certainly not COVID or anything like that. Um, so what we do in broad sense, and I'll, I'll break this out a little more uh, in a few minutes. We actively, and that's the key word, seek to connect with people we do not know. We don't just sit around hoping they'll come in the door. <clears throat> we invite them to special activities. And that can include your normal Sunday morning service, but you're much, much more likely to get an impact on other things. And then we continue to work on that relationship, trying to get them to know us. And we do that for months. And one of the biggest problems we run into is leadership that becomes discouraged because there's no obvious results. You know, there'll be somebody on the vestry that say, we ran two ads two weeks ago. How come the church isn't full? Um, That's why we got to keep on right from the beginning explaining that it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And because the goal is to be in a relationship strong enough that we can have those deep, meaningful conversations. <coughs> I am sorry, I can't get rid of that. Um, what we're talking about today, I just call stages, this stage, is the one that has the biggest difference between large churches, small churches, and very small churches. Um, for all the other stuff, the, the church is doing basically the same thing. It's just maybe the magnitude. And so I am, and I, I, I mean it, petrified that I will offer too little for the larger churches, and I don't challenge them, or so much that smaller churches block my email. One of the things I've learned in doing public speaking is I always try to imagine kind of a typical person listening. In this case, I'm focusing on a church of something around 80 to 100 on an average Sunday. A better way to phrase it is a church that's barely holding on to a full-time priest. <laughs> so you're small, you're, you're tiny churches like two of you. Let's, let's talk specifically about your circumstance because it is very different. And in the larger churches, I have lots of ideas and information I'm not sharing. So, Beth, if there's anybody else you can talk to or whatever, let me know. Let's sit down and talk. It's much better to talk on a personal level. And remember, you will not do everything. Pick something that seems important to do and do it well. And then let the other things just go. Okay, why why don't people love us? Well, and this is a really big challenge. I think most of our leadership are older, I think, you know. And a lot of them, I suspect, maybe not in your church, but certainly in many of the churches I've worked with, they can't quite grasp, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, and I really don't, but they remember growing up, everybody went to church. 
you didn't do anything else on Sunday morning. You couldn't even buy a loaf of bread on Sunday morning. And everybody was just expected to go to church. And they don't understand why that isn't still true. And one of the, one of the phrases I've, I've thought of, one of the uh, images I've thought about is uh, if we're in the middle of a snowstorm in January, we might wish it's June and a beautiful weather. But you can't operate that way. You got to operate as if it's January in a blizzard. You got to operate in the situation you're in. And the situation we're in is that church means to these people hypocritical, judgmental, self righteous, arrogant, unforgiving, selfish, disrespectful. That's what they think when they hear the word church. And this link here, if you want to look it up, this is the link from the survey that the Episcopal Church paid for. Somebody, you know, professionals did them and it wasn't just Episcopalians. And it has some wonderful charts and stuff and some good quotes from Bishop Curry that if you want to use them in your newsletters or something like that. Um, it, when, when they think of church, though, they're not getting the true picture of your church. And that's our struggle. They've got, we've got to help them understand who we are and quit putting those images onto us. And it's important to, to, to tell them, yes, it's absolutely important to show them. But another thing I'll be, over the many years I've grown, I used to be one of those people that said, um, it, you know, all that matters is we show God's love. And I still think that's very, you know, very, very, very important. But then I got thinking, the person knows that the um, homeless shelter is staffed every night. Maybe they know, but probably don't, that most of those volunteers come from churches. And I'd be willing to bet they never once have thought that those volunteers are at the homeless shelter because they're trying to fulfill God's love. So, yeah, we got to have something to show them, but we got to explain it to them, too, because they won't make the connection. So do we have a potential to reach new people? And the answer is yes if we're willing to do the work, but it's not hard, it's not expensive, it's not time consuming. Uh, because, and, and I have a de I have the detailed write up on this if anyone wants it to share. Despite all those negatives, something around one in three people near you are willing to talk spirituality. They're not anxious to, if they were anxious to, they'd make the move to come see you, but they're willing and they're very cautious but they already have an overloaded calendar. They're not ready to start attending church most likely, but if we approach them correctly, which means we approach them with respect for who they are, they are willing to talk. So the overall process is people must be intrigued enough to look, know us, like us, trust us, and then interact with us is where we're gonna spend our time now. And then maybe relate with us, Interact is the phrase I'm using for any kind of personal inter connection. Uh, and it could be fairly, you know, uh, somebody hitting like on a post. Uh, I'm, I'm putting that in the connect connected in the interaction level. So it doesn't have to be much, but it just has to be a little something. So I'll, I'll this one I'll just skim by. But basically, we started with the uh, it, with the intrigue phase. And then we... Um, the third phase, last phase, is building the relationship, and we're in the intermediate stage here, if you will, which involves inter interacting with them more directly. And I'm not suggesting that um, <coughs> I missed that. Bad. I'm sorry, my, my two and a half finger typing is even worse than my normal typing. So surely there's a typo on that page too. Um, Interaction could be any number of things, but I want to I want to go through this list so you can be thinking about it. Uh, it could be something like an ice cream social for the kids. It could be going to the community um, crop walk. Uh, it could be a bazaar. It could be the bazaar you hold, and I don't think many people have ever thought of that as a way to connect with people in the community. It certainly, could be a Bible study or an online discussion, special worship services, regular worship services. Yes. I'm not demeaning, uh, diminishing the importance of our just regular Sunday morning services. What I'm trying to get across is all those people know we do that. 
We're not giving them any information that matters when we say we're doing a Sunday morning service. They know we're doing a Sunday morning service. Um, so anything that might bring a new guest into contact with us. Now, the activities that are going to be most effective are those that feel safe to this new person. They don't feel like they're going to be conned, railroad, captured, any of that kind of stuff. And here's where we're starting to move into the details on this. That consider convenience for your guests. If we want to have people, new people, we need to focus on our being convenient for our guests, not us necessarily. And things like the day, the time, the location, they have childcare, food, all that kind of thing. What would be convenient for them? And the issue becomes, and, and you'll, yeah, I'm sure you'll get some pushback. I always did. Uh, do we care enough about, about inviting new people to allow ourselves to be inconvenienced? Now, as I say that, I want to point out there's absolutely nothing wrong with having good, strong boundaries. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, point, there's a balancing act there. But um, as an example, uh, most of our churches did do blessing of backpacks or something similar at the beginning of the school year. And it was on Sunday morning. Well, that's fine for our people, but it's unlikely anybody from outside came in at that point. But if we do it on, say, a Sunday evening and we do it, but we also include, say, ice cream, uh, we also reach out to teachers and, and janitors and all that. We got a, the same basic event. And it's a little less convenient because we've actually moved it out of the Sunday. Um, but it's very different. It's much more likely to involve people. Actually, I used that example in another group, and uh, and somebody chatted in and said, no, you misunderstand. You're actually more convenient for the teenagers that didn't want to get up in the morning anyway. So <laughs> it's actually a better time for them. Uh, uh, and you might find a need to add activities, but that's not the lead. The lead is that you are already doing things people like you want to attend. It's being able to get their get their attention to do those minor tweaks. Um, the questions as you're going on, and this is one, this is a, a um, activity I would suggest maybe putting on your calendar for mid January. is not this not the time to be doing it. But to look at your long range calendar and ask the questions, who outside of our church might be interested in, in a certain activity? Uh, and then what demographic groups have we not addressed? All right, there's, there's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with admitting that certain events are, are more likely to attend to attract certain people. There are things that are more likely to attract an older adult. There are things that are more likely to attract a child or parents. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. If being multiracial is a, is a core value of ours, something we really want to do, well, then we need to step down and say, are we doing things likely to encourage that to happen? Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with do, I mean, targeting. That's exactly what we're doing. So types of activities and in person, the, I've divided them into four categories, predominantly spiritual, certainly Sunday services. But as I say, the regular Sunday service is less likely to attract somebody who is totally disconnected. I mean, it will some and we're going to invite them, but just be honest about it. Uh, Blue Christmas. If you don't know, this is um, a, a service on the longest night of the year. Which in which people who for whom Christmas is not going to be a joyful thing, they've lost a spouse this year, that kind of thing. Uh, I think just offering this as a pastoral service to the community is important if nobody else gets involved, but knowing it's there. And lots of people will appreciate it, but not actually walk in the door. That's okay. They've gotten a good impression of your church. Christmas Eve. Predominantly previously church people. You're again, you're unlikely to uh, attract somebody whose family has, hasn't been to church in a generation and a half. But people who grew up in the church, maybe through their teenage years or something, there's that's that's the um, demographic you're most likely to see. And if you ask those people, 
What do they remember about Christmas Eve? They will mention two things, candle lighting and Christmas carols. And as a preacher, I hate to admit it, but not a one of them will mention a sermon. You know, um, And so we're, I'm going to show you some things we can do. Uh, this will be predominantly next week's uh, presentation to, for example, use Christmas carols as a way to attract people's attention. Uh, a special speaker is a possibility. Uh, Youth-led service, yeah, not likely to see anybody, but maybe a couple of their friends, maybe. Um, but another one, and, and Beth served in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, has done a good job with this, is reach out to other locations that have independent living. Uh, this, is, this is a great, great opportunity. Most of those locations uh, are filled with people who are moving into town. They, 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 they did not grow up in this town, or at least not in this particular neighborhood. And they, they want to build relations. And if we reach out to them, there's a possibility they'll come back to us at some point. All right, then, yeah, yeah Beth. Yeah, so Ken, I would, ask, I would um, uh, add that um, I think your, your encouragement to really step back and think about, uh, you know, who is in your vicinity really does help a lot. We have a preschool with 100 kids in it, mm -hmm. and the kids have siblings, and there are only six of those children who go to our church. It's a mm -hmm. dual language preschool, and we have a fair number of um, bilingual members, and we do ESL as well, and for uh, an event that was held last night, um, we were just more disciplined. You know, we invited. Uh, we did. We did. You can, I mean, Google Translate's actually not bad. And I will say doing English and Spanish, um, uh, the dual language churches is, is a hard, that's a hard deal. I'll just say that up front. So, but the bottom line is we were intentional. Yeah. Exactly. And we made sure that everybody got an invitation. Um, we made sure that the invitation set didn't have insider language. Mm -hmm. Like talk to Susie. Who's Susie? Yeah, who's Susie? How do you talk to Susie? How do you reach Susie? And you really, you really do have to think all the way through the process of what what door do you go in? Um, I mean, you really do. But that said, Ken, I don't know if you ever saw our numbers, but our numbers for blessing of the animals were up again this year. I never saw a good. Yeah, and they were up notably, and. Um, you know, so this discipline process of inviting people to, to things that are safe mm -hmm. um, really does work. Yeah. And I think part of it is, is and, and absolutely the, the discipline, a big part of it is saying, hey, we're doing interesting stuff. You know, we need to tell people about it. You know, it's, it's actually, you're right. I'm, I'm embarrassed by how few churches reach out to the parents of the people in the daycare. And, and I'm not saying being pushy and saying you have to go, you know, but just this is something you might be interested in. Um, and, you know, it's just amazing. Ken, I, I, would, I would say how shocked I am at that too. In many cases, those families consider that, that church to be their church and we don't even acknowledge it. Yep. yep. Um, so anyway, well, the church I go to has actually done something I'm, I'm extremely proud of. Kind of, I don't want to say the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> but when they were bringing, uh, during COVID, they were bringing food from the food pantry out to the car. And part of what they did at that point, and the people knew this was coming, they said, is there anything you want us to pray with you for? And if the people want prayer right at that moment, they pulled over to the side and prayed with them. If not, you know, they just hand wrote it. Because again, we 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 tend to treat them like I don't know what consumers or something, you know, and we don't think about extending ourselves there. But yeah, in fact, we're going to come back to the daycare in just a second. Uh, on educational stuff, religious stuff, most likely you want to keep it short. Again, if you want to be effective to the person who isn't already connected. Uh, they don't want to sign up for a 16-week session. Now, if you want to take a 16-week section session and subdivide it and have them only sign up for the first three weeks, that's fine. 
That's fine. There's a little tiny bit of work uh, doing it. The other thing is almost all of us, when we announce something, it's boring. We need to make it exciting. Uh, think of the difference of saying uh, we're going to have a Bible study on the Gospel of John. Okay. We're going to have a Bible study on the Gospel of John that includes consideration on who Jesus wants us to forgive. Okay, that's more interesting. We're going to do a Bible study on the Gospel of John, and we're going to ask the question, if, does Jesus really expect me to forgive the person who abused me? Okay, that's going to grab people's attention. So the issue is think through the personal problems that Pat is solving or addressing. Uh, general interest stories, whatever people in your congregation are interested in, you probably have somebody who has special expertise. Uh, and again, that just says to the community, yes, you're interested in the environment or affordable housing or whatever. And also, it gives you that chance over coffee and snacks afterwards to get their name. Uh, and don't don't forget to you know use what's happening at the denominational level. It doesn't have to be something your particular church is doing. You can say, you know, the my diocese, or don't use diocese, diocese is jargon, uh, but some of the Episcopal churches in this area are whatever. And then you have the mixed things, blessing of animals, backpacks, gardens, labyrinth walks. Um, just kind of put in the back of your mind for just a second, the blessing of the gardens can be a great thing. It's basically the parallel to blessing of the animals. In fact, the one time I laid out a service, I just took the blessing of the animal service and made some modifications to it. Um, but it's a great way. And one of the neat things you can do with it is we invited people to plant an extra tomato plant or whatever. And then when they start to harvest, bring that to the food pantry. You know, so you, you're hitting several things at the same time. Um, now, how do we do it? How do we connect through those things? Most important, if we can get this through our head, we're 50%, 75% of the way there. We'll never have a visitor. We will only have guests. If we think of the difference between we have visitors versus guests. And the bazaar shopper is a good example. Shopper at the bazaar. I'm not talking about the person. The person who's coming to shop at the bazaar. Um, if we think of those as guests in our church, rather than simply who's coming in to buy a couple of old t-shirts, that our interaction with them changes dramatically. And the goal we should have is that they are comfortable. They do. They leave there thinking this is a nice place to be. They are educated. They've learned something about us, something about our church. And they're intrigued enough that they want additional information. <laughs> Now, I, I, I repeated the, the five second, three to five second rules, but the other one I want to add is the six foot rule. In the United States, something around five to six feet is considered a uh, personal space. It's, it, you, you get closer than that and people start to feel uncomfortable unless you are a friend. Uh, people should be able to grasp the basic message from you know, around six feet away. And one of the worst things we do is name tags. Uh, as a man, let me tell you, I have not looked at a woman's name tag in 20 years because if I can't read it from six feet away, I ain't going to get that close to read it. Um, and so you're basically wasting your time. If not, actually, it's a little off-putting. Um, now, what we do, you don't need professional production in any mean. With what's available now with cameras and, uh, and simple free graphic programs, you can do plenty of stuff. But it does take a little bit of time. So it's always good to start early. Our guests should be thinking leaving this is a friendly group of people, yes. But again, just being friendly is not enough. And as I say, focus on three to five themes. Down at the bottom, I have the comment that some churches may want to include worship. And Shirley's a choir leader. So I'll get in trouble with this, but she'll admit to it. In some cases, the choir will be upset if you don't focus on the Sunday morning worship. And that's okay if that's if that's one of the things you want to. But 
I get, remember that the person you're trying to reach knows you hold Sunday morning worship. So if you're going to use that, if you can come up with something unusual about it, for example, there's the church in, uh, where are they? Long Beach, I think. Long Beach, California. Um, that does a Taze service once a month. And I talk to them and I say, you know, that's great. It's wonderful. I think it really touched a lot of people, but those people don't know what Taze is. So let's begin by getting the word out about what it is and then gradually reach with them. Uh, there's a church in Rochester, New York that does a jazz service, which is quite good. Um, again, we reach out to them. Now, again, this the basic Sunday morning service. If you can find a, a hook to talk about it, that makes it that makes it better than just simply saying we have service at eleven o'clock. What I'm hoping that I'm doing is to encourage you to think of those things that we're doing as what they are. They're the Sunday morning worship. They're the book sale. They're the whatever, but also an opportunity to make a connection. It goes back to what Beth was saying. Plan on being deliberate about saying this can also be an opportunity for us to connect with new people. What I want you to be doing is asking that question, and, and that's the question if I'm talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, you'll hear me asking, how can we turn this into an opportunity to make a connection? Typically, and, and the research is pretty solid on this, although with COVID, you know, no research is real solid anymore, but probably still pretty good. Less than 10% of first-time Sunday guests will be active in the church one year later. And that's predominantly because we didn't keep in touch. We, in today's terms, we ghosted them. Actually, the number most researchers say is much lower than that. Because most of the research asks the question, have they come back one time? They have not asked, are they active a year later? Um, and then if you go and look at the majority, the vast majority of guests that come on your property, the people that came to attend a bazaar or something like that, if 1% ended up being active, that would be really shocking. Um, so if we've, you know, trying to think of a good image, we're like a store that has lots of people wandering up and down the aisles, but we don't sell them anything. But we're not trying to sell people something, but you maybe get the image. We got the people in there. So anyway, goals for your event, attendance uh, part, um, and we'll talk a lot about all this next week. Uh, if Come up with a way, a reason to get registration if possible, but also stress that drop-in is fine. Uh, so for example, and I'll talk about the drop-in Christmas play uh, this evening. Uh, you ask the question, what part would your child like to play, an angel, sheep, cow, or you could just come in and we'll find them the right part. That then gives them a reason to submit their registration if they want to, and it gets you their contact information. Uh, if it's anything spiritual, always offer an opportunity to submit prayers, Veterans Day, uh, you know, Grandparents Day, whatever. Um, polls can be great, and I said something about this earlier, but I'm going to suggest next week you spend some time using Christmas carols as a way to attract people's attention, to intrigue them, and, you know, emphasize to the musicians, they will still pick what goes on. We're going to ask for ideas, but there's, the musicians are still in charge. Um, raffles, other giveaways work well. Sometimes, and Kathy is great at this, um, you might find a local merchant willing to what, give away a couple Christmas-themed items. Certainly do that. It could be gift baskets. It could be a tree or a wreath, um, any of that kind of thing. Then you have an online raffle, and you get their contact information. Um, if it's something unusual, try for media coverage. And weekly typically are the best bet, although I don't exclude daily newspapers or TV. But I'm just saying you're most likely to get uh, a coverage on a weekly. And I can show you some uh, ideas about that if you ask. Blue Christmas is new in many areas. Christmas carols, don't do that to me. Um, Christmas carols around the bon bonfire is something that's very different. We got, and, and I'll talk about that more in a minute in detail, but uh, we got, uh, 
three different years we got TV coverage, I think, at least two. Um, you know, you got kids, you got a bonfire, you know, it's, it's a great thing for TV. Uh, if you can possibly try to use a meet your neighbors theme, this is one of the things we are offering people that that they want, that people over and over and over say they want, is a connection. It's a neighborly connection. In addition to the spiritual thing, we're offering friendship. So build on that. Um, meet some neighbors while singing Christmas carols at our bonfire with hot chocolate and s'mores. Maybe depending on what the neighborhood is you're in, ask the neighborhood group to co-sponsor, but keep it at your church. But they might be able to bring in some people you wouldn't be able to reach. Again, treat them as guests you are hosting. And the, I said, if you kind of get your head around the word guest, you've got a big part of it understood. If you get your head around the fact you're hosting, you got the rest of it. We're not just simply greeting them or being friendly. We're being a host. And that's very different. Minimum two hosts. Kathy and I were talking about this before we started. You've got, on Sunday morning, there's about a, you know, no magic to it, but about a three-minute period from about six minutes before the worship to about three minutes before the worship in which you're most likely to see a first-time guest. You can't talk to two guests in that period of time. You can't host two guests. So you've got to have multiple people ready. Larger church, even more. Christmas Eve, even more. And you know, one of the ways to do that is you have the people trained and say, Harry, you're not on this week, but how about you just hang in the narthex in case we need you? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And ask what you would expect. You know, this is another be great coffee hour type thing or small group thing or ask, what would you expect? You'd expect a warm welcome. You'd want the warmth, but no insistence on certain things. You'd want the answers to obvious questions like the restroom, coffee, snacks, depending on what kind of activity it is. Um, consistent answers about children. The, the family walking in is very nervous about what's going to happen with their children. Just assume that. Take care of that from the very beginning. If there's no nursery, just start by saying, oh, great, we love having children in our service. That takes all the stress off. If there is a nursery, <laughs> um, you want to, <laughs> cough so hard, I moved it. Um, you want to say, and I think it's very important to say, we love having children in the service. Start there. And then, or if you prefer, we have a nursery which uh, follows safety rules. Because people, people aren't really as anxious as they were even 10 years ago to drop their children off somebody they don't know. Uh, you should have changing tables. And I recommend having wipes and diapers, just kind of a small emergency kit in both the men's and the ladies' room. And probably more important in the men's room, because the ladies, the mothers probably brought their diaper bag. The men may not have remembered. Um, not that I ever did that. but. I, I hear it's happened. Um, if there is a nursery, escort them there. And I don't care if it's directly across the hall. And introduce them to the nervous nursery keepers. Again, host, not just greet. Explain what happens at communion and try, if at all possible, to make it their choice. Lots of our families bring their children in for communion. If you'd like us to do that, just let us know. Got of thing. The last thing you want is this family is feeling pretty good and communion starts and all of a sudden somebody they don't know walks down the aisle and hands their kid to them. Uh, that's a little creepy. Um, if there's an infant in arms, mention where there is some quiet space. And here I'm thinking for a nursing mother. This space could have bottled water, snacks, wipes, paper, that kind of thing. Great question is, are you familiar with the Episcopal Church? Terrible question. Are you new in town? Are you new in town sounds accusatory or it can, you know, well, if you're not new in town, where have you been? Are you familiar with the Episcopal service? More times than not, we'll get you their story. Uh, and it'll probably give you more information than you really expected. And, you know, it's, it's absolutely true. A woman typically makes the decision on religious services. Again, typically different, different households are different, but 
if a woman is happy, they may come back. If the children are happy, they will be back. So figure out how we can do to make them comfortable. One of the most important things is with the children is acknowledge them. You know, we're up there above their head talking to their parents and ignoring them. Well, you know, that doesn't that doesn't bring in a good feeling. So lean down and say, hey, Jamie, what you know, what's going on? And OK, what we want to do is want to tell our story, not give them information. Telling them that the youth group is meeting tonight is giving them information. Telling a story about the youth group that includes them coming tonight. And it may only be a few words different. It's just the way it's presented. Uh, it can be really difficult to tell your story on Sunday morning, particularly when you have a small narthex where there's really no room to post anything. Uh, maybe uh, put a signboard outside if the weather's good. Um, but another thing to do is sit down and think through your bulletin and your spoken announcements. Think about them as a telling of your story, not simply giving out information. Is there a way you can structure it, format it, uh, phrase it? Again, we're not putting a whole lot of different words. Uh, that comes across more like a storytelling. Now, I want you to picture Christmas Eve. Imagine every seat's taken, um, and some of them are the pre-COVID people returning, and ask yourself this question. What did they learn that encourages them to come back before next Christmas? What ongoing ministries or special activities would interest them? How do they know about these? Very important to do to think that through and try to say, we really hope you'll be back. But not to say, we hope you'll be back. Give them a reason. So, for example, <laughs> our next church service is Epiphany. Epiphany, by the way, is jargon about knowing Jesus. So our adult discussion services will focus on that. I hope to have some discussion about how Jesus is seen in other cultures. I, I heard one just a couple weeks ago about uh, Jesus in the Islamic faith that I thought I knew. I thought I knew that relationship. I did not. So that was really fascinating. The point is there is not a whole lot we can tell about our story on Sunday. We got to do what we can. So that... <laughs> just emphasizes the need for weekly communication. Now, remember that 99.99999% of the people in your community will not attend your event. They won't be there Christmas Eve, they won't be there in the morning, they won't be at the bazaar. But they can still get a good impression about you. There's a reason that the political uh, season was just ended, thank God, uh, you had all those signs that simply had somebody's name. They were trying to build an awareness, a connection um, with, with potential voters. Well, some of us think that's what we're doing. Um, some posts can be designed to say, to create a wish I had gone feeling. If possible, do all outside events where they can be seen from the road, because then the passerby thinks this place has fun things happening. For some reason, most of our churches have their space behind the building where it can't be seen. Well, <clears throat> I got grief every time I tried to move it, but I did. I won <laughs> most of the time. So anyway, online activities. We can turn these from, from an impersonal to semi-personal. Not, not, again, not as personal as shaking hands with them at the bazaar, but it can be a whole lot semi-personal. And the goal is to connect with them, involve them as much as possible. So for worship, for example, of a verbal welcome at the beginning by the worship leader, the, usually the priest. Um, we, we particularly welcome those who are watching this morning, that kind of thing. Think about what happens in your narthex, in, in, in person, all right? We can translate some of that, a large chunk of that, into online. If you have somebody watching, and they could be watching from Brazil or something, they don't even have to be personal, you know, nearby but just interacts with the people when they come on. Are we not hearing? No, I'm that person and I'm oh. usually in Boston and I'm usually in Boston. Good. Almost always. 
And so this is actually a ministry that That's somebody true. who is at home, mm-hmm. who is homebound in your church to, can do. Mm-hmm. Um, you, for whatever reason, mine happens to be that I'm in Boston, the church is in Charlotte. But um, but this is definitely a great ministry for a homebound person. Exactly. Exactly. And we forget those. But it goes in both directions. The homebound person is going to feel better if they do sign in and somebody acknowledges them. You know, it just it feels more welcoming rather than, you know, walking into sitting and being ignored. And there's lots of things you can do, lots of different ways you can do this. Uh, we were at a church where they actually had the way their screens were set up in the front to show the, the service, the, the bulletin was on a screen. They actually, at the end of the service, people gathered around the screen and they had a coffee hour with the people who were online. They just exchanged conversation. Hey, Hey, Bert, how'd that surgery go? You know, that kind of stuff. And I I just, I was fascinated by that. Um, Of course, non-worship online activities can include just about anything. And the concept is always the same. It is hard to do well. Just just acknowledge that and accept that. And remember, it's new for for the participant as well as for the leader. And it's actually more difficult to do it hybrid if it's, you're with three or four or five people, the leaders with three or four or five people, and uh, and there's others online. That that is really hard, hard thing to pull off. But it can it can be done. I've seen it done well. It just takes some practice, some time. And what I said was help, helpful criticism. People who will say, "Why didn't you do this?" I, in fact, I wrote one of our priests uh, just the other day that I watched was flipping through watching some services and. Uh, she did such a great job of keeping eye contact with the camera. Um, you know, she would her eyes, she'd sweep her eyes across the across the congregation and then she'd pause at the camera. And it was, you know, they were just part, we were part of what was going on. And I'm sure she practiced that over and over and over again. All right, now very quickly, this is one thing you can do, which is fairly easy. Come on now. You're gonna. No, oh, what did you do to me? Well, it might work better that way, actually. There we go. And a special peace to everyone who is new to us with us today. We're glad you're here. We are hoping we can give you some information about what's going on around here, and we would love to say my point only was rather we, we got points in the uh in our live stream, which would be particularly appropriate to reach out to new people, not necessarily in a two-way conversation. And don't have to be new people. Could be a could be a founding member, um, but to uh, interact with them, and that is extremely easy to do. I, I was shocked. I, I played with it on and off for a while, and then finally I said, "Okay, I'm going to take a day and learn this." And it took about two hours. It's very very easy. Basically, what you do is you type out your message, um, <laughs> and it's set up so you say, uh, uh, "Show a request for donations." You click on that. You wait as long as you want. You click on stop showing requests for donations. Very, very easy to do. But it's a way to interact again with people. So anyway, I'll end with just a few of my favorite activities that aren't as, or maybe they may be tweaks of things people do, um, particularly for small churches, the no practice, multi-generational pageant. Um, and more non-members will attend if it's not held during worship and you announce there's a cast party with cookies and stuff afterwards and that kind of thing and just plan on adults and do just adult only if if you're not sure you'll get any kids be willing to go that way be be willing to be uncomfortable um you could do one that there's no speaking parts just narration and you have somebody that just guides the kids to walk in certain places uh, it's very easy to add a sheep or an angel, you know, at the last second. Your children invite their friends. The best way to get kids to come is have their have them invite their friends. Uh, we talked about a little bit about daycare centers, absolutely. And then follow up immediately. If if you possibly can get a physical address for the family, send a note to the child. They, they, they haven't gotten, you know, other than maybe a birthday card. They don't get notes. So if they get a note that addressed, Dear Harry, you are a wonderful sheep, <laughs> that'll mean a lot. 
And then on uh, December 31, invite them to Christmas Eve. <laughs> on the traditional pageant, very aware of the variety of, of attitudes toward this. And if you're in one of those places where, you know, basically the, the director is a, is a Broadway director and everything is, you know, don't even talk about changing things. But if you can, uh, ask them to have a couple extra angel and sheep costumes ready. You probably will be whatever time they want it to be. Uh, but remember, you know, they're not going to be, I, I mean, I hope you have dozens of new kids, but it's unlikely if you get two or three. Um, now back to the um, no practice. One thing we did a couple of years was we actually teamed up with another small church and we negotiated back and forth. And finally, what we did is we got the kids to agree to do the pageant twice. Both churches wanted to make sure it was at their church. So we, the kids agreed to do the pageant twice. I had to buy them pizza twice. But, you know, other than that, it was no problem. And we had a great time. We had a great time. Uh, the other pastor moved on, and and I, then I moved on. So I don't even know if it's still going on or anything. Carol's Around the Bonfire, another one I love, particularly to get decent weather. We we kind of had it the Friday before Christmas, depending on the calendar. It might be two Fridays. An amplified guitar can work fine. A keyboard's a bit better. Your only real challenge is sharing the words. Paper copies are hard to read, even if you bump them up to like a, an eighteen point or something. Um, if you, I, I, you know, if you do projection, that's so cheap now, uh, and you can actually rent a blow up screen fairly inexpensively. You go to one of the gaming stores, one of the party stores, and ask. They they may be willing to donate it for a night. One of the keys, two, two keys I learned to make them focus better. Just do the do the carol until you've gotten through the known hymn, the known verses. By the time you get to verse four of um, some of these carols, nobody knows what it is. So just do the verse one and two. Just do what everybody knows. Second of all, if you're going to do a marshmallow, really easy is um, wooden dowels at your lumber yard, quarter inch, uh, fit into, they're basically pencil size. Uh, put them in an electric pencil sharpener. It's the same wood. Um, they may make great marshmallow sticks. Get it done in 15 minutes. Anyway, as I said before, do it in a location where people can drive by and see it and say, hey, what's so special about that church? Another mistake I made. Make sure you get the fire permit or it might be more exciting than you want it to be. Um, but invite the fire station. When you go to get the permit, invite the fire station. Um, yeah. Darn it. Consider inviting the police on patrol to drop in. Um, you can just call the non-emergency desk and say, hey, we're doing this. If any of your patrol officers want to drop in while, we're, while they're traveling by, tell them to come on by. Um, and then Blue Christmas, I mentioned earlier, I like the term Blue Christmas rather than Longest Night because Longest Night doesn't really connect it to Christmas. I have some uh, liturgies if you need them. Uh, always, this is another great one to offer the opportunity of people to submit prayers even if they don't attend. A couple places to reach out to when you have it scheduled. And it depends entirely upon the organization, which ones will be effective and which ones won't. Hospice has always has bereavement groups, and they might be willing to share their this information with their people, just make people aware of it. Some funeral homes have bereavement groups. They might be willing to share it. And some hospitals have groups. Talk to the chaplain. And what we're trying to do there is get the word out. Although it's very possible. <laughs> hospice, for example, you'll end up getting some hospice staff coming. Uh, this is a great item for a news article, as is the carols around the bonfire. And I do have models if anybody, you know, has never done a news release before and wants some help with that. I'd be happy to help you. Most of all, pray. Uh, that, you know, if we pray every time, we just try not to hustle, hustle through it, but actually spend time thinking about it. That can make all the difference in the world. And then most important of all, how can I help you? And in that uh, vein, I'm perfectly willing. I've been working with Kathy on her texting. Uh, I'm perfectly willing to work with any other churches. 
and I really do want to talk to the churches one on one so I can be a more more personal assistance. I can know what you need so I can help you out some. Next week, we will be doing uh, what I call stage one, which is the intrigue stage. We'll be talking about how to put stuff on Facebook and some of the brand new stuff that's come out on Facebook and Instagram. I mean, like within the last few weeks. Uh, and and it, they've, I was just telling Kathy, Facebook did a 180 on a couple things uh, to our benefit. I have no idea why they did it because it helps us. Mm, I am sorry for that coughing. So anyway, if you'll unmute yourself or whatever, and we'll see what kind of other comments or, and Beth, I got your comment about uh, how to go, once once we've made it, let me, let me phrase it the way I think, and you tell me if I got it. Um, once we have made these com these connections, how do we actually move deeper in those conversations? How do we avoid just keeping them at superficial level? Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, I definitely am. And, and part of that, frankly, is because my observation is we've been coached to make our websites uh, so simple that there's not much substantive information on websites. So yep. it's kind of like, you know, you've got a, the three second rule, the one second or the five second. Yep. And so all we communicate is depth of three seconds. And um, I will tell you, I will, uh, and I can I've had this comment, I've had this conversation, I'm beginning to have this conversation with the clergy at Holy Comforter. As somebody who's in Boston, that if you really think seriously about how well people can engage with your social media or your um, internet presence, whatever virtual presence, you will be disappointed in how thin that um, interaction is. Even yes. if you do worship well, mm -hmm. um, they're cut off from the rest of the life of church, when in many cases, they really don't have to be. Okay, let me, let me try this image on you. What we're doing is like a fine restaurant offering samples. And that's our role. That's this role. But you're at, we, need, we want them to go further. No question about it. And there's a couple things I would suggest, and I'll send you the link. Uh, Jerusalem Greer at the national office has some really good stuff. And she and I have talked about this, how she picks up where I'm kind of finishing. And it, it's, it's a hard thing to do. Now, as far as the websites, and, and Lorenzo, <laughs> we always got two more projects in mind. Um, one of the things we're talking about is, I don't know if you've seen, but N.T. Wright, who some people love, some people hate, does this... Um, Oh, what's he call it? But basically, he does just a two-minute presentation on, on various topics. Um, and that's something I would like to see churches consider putting on their website. Not, not N.T. Wright, but pick some, pick some common topics and do a, a little short two- to five-minute presentation. You go a little – you can spend time because now you've intrigued the person – they're interested, and they um, they have asked to know more. They have asked to become involved, uh, and and that's 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 where we can get a lot more done. So they, what I'm talking about is getting them to the door, maybe open the door, maybe looking in. All right. Now, what Jerusalem picks up on is where do we go from there? And I don't know if you remember, but several years ago, the church had this. Oh, what did they call it? Ah, but you got decks of cards, not not as in number cards, but uh, each of which had uh, a leading question on it. And you invited people in for coffee or something. And they were nice. I really liked the questions. They were kind of an intermediate level. You, you could answer them semi-superficially. They weren't, they weren't shoving it down your throat, but it also could easily lead to something very deep. And, you know, that's a wonderful. Now, again, the question is how to get people together to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you had my, my feeling is if back to what I was saying about how you announce uh, any continuing ed, if you if you if people got familiar with the fact that they could submit a question and every Thursday night at seven o'clock, we're going to have a discussion based on the questions that were submitted. And we spend time on that. And people, I really like, I haven't seen the latest stuff. I really like the Alpha program. I don't know if 
anybody knows the album. Okay. And the thing I like about it best is its uh, tagline. Um, where I, it's something like, where I can ask the questions I was never allowed to ask. <laughs> you know, I think that's the attitude we want to grab. Um, one of the churches here in town is using it right now. And I, I want to get with the rector and see how it went. I didn't, more information than you want. I did not like the middle three sections on the Holy Spirit. I thought they were poorly done. Uh, now I'm going back probably three generations of material. Um, so I just rewrote it. You know, and I, what I did is I, I was very open about it. I said, this is what I didn't like about it. If you want to see it, I'd be happy to show you the video, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you my approach on it. No, I didn't. So. Uh -oh. Ken, Ken, about two years ago, they redid all the videos. Yeah, I've, I've heard that, but I just never yeah. met. There, the, many of them are good, but I agree with you. There's a section of it that I would not show myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and just very briefly, the concern was it was on the Holy Spirit, and the only part of the Holy Spirit they talked about was speaking in tongues. Oh. And, you know, there's a difference from being scared to talk about that and not talking about anything else. And that's exactly how I presented it. I said, I'm going to talk about it, but there's lots of other manifestations of the Holy Spirit that we need to be, uh, uh, we need to be aware of. Oh, I like this. I think this came from you, Beth. You do event specific name tags, just asking people to write it or is that somebody else? Yeah, that's, that's me. <clears throat> um, and that you, so here's a lot of times people don't want to do that because of the cost. Yeah. But you can actually get peelable adhesive name tags off the internet for really good prices. Mm -hmm. And there's something about, we do this with a, a big book study that we do. And when you just make it standard, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you'll say, you know, put a little icon or draw a picture yeah. or whatever, but people do it and it does not take long. Um, so if you, I actually think it's easier to do that than to have, you know, name tags hanging up on racks and all that kind of stuff. It's easier to do event-specific name tags. Yep. Um, uh, Grace in Clayton, North Carolina. Uh, when you walk in the door, there's a table there with the bulletin and all that. And there's a, gre there's a, there's a greeter, more than all But anyway, a person there saying hello. And fill out your name tag and I'll give you a bulletin. And because, as you say, because everybody's doing it, I've, I've stood off to the side and watched, um, you aren't sure who coming in is, is new or not, you know, and they see everybody else doing it, so it's new. Now, okay, it was actually funny. Um, we, we sat down in front of a woman on Sunday and just turned around and introduced ourselves. It was a couple minutes before the service started. Turns out, first timer, and I don't remember what the pastor said. Oh, oh, I know what it was. Our, our um, Afghan family had come. It was one year. They'd been with us one year, and they just come to, to thank us and be part of the service for one time, that kind of stuff. Um, and she looked at us with this look in her eye and said, he's not going to ask me to stand up, is he? <laughs> we said, no. <laughs> no, we said, you're, you're safe. You're safe. But it is, and you know, when, you know, like I say, when people talk about cost, if you look at what it costs to do the regular name, the, the fancy printed name tags, and the fact that most of them get left at home, the stick on ones are actually cheaper. You know, now you feel like it's an mm -hmm. environmental disaster, but, you know. Yeah, and, and you also said, and you're absolutely right, when you're talking about Blue Christmas, you're not necessarily talking about who's somebody who lost a loved one this year. Oh, yeah. Um, my ex-mother-in-law died, well, it would have been today. And uh, it wasn't this month, day of the month, but it was two days before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that's still a sad time in the family. I mean, that was, Lord, surely was it 15 years ago, 12 years ago? So, you know, um, so, yeah, it doesn't require it to be one. The other thing we can do with Blue Christmas, too, is is come right out and say, would you also like us to remind you of the uh, when, when Christmas Eve service comes along? So we send them up. 
the most important, I didn't put this slide in, <laughs> is when we do get the slightest connection with people, we follow up on it. We respond. Uh, if somebody sends us a uh, text saying, would you please pray for my Uncle Sam? Uh, you know, the first thing we do is we send something back saying, thank you for asking. Then after the service, we send them another one saying, yes, we did pray. Uh, if it's something that is like Uncle Sam's having surgery next Wednesday, next Friday, you send them a text saying, how did he do? We've been praying for him. You know, they, they, another way I look, I've begun to look at it. And this, I, I hadn't thought about this till fairly recently. When somebody does that, when somebody clicks like on a on a on a post or sends in a request for prayer, so it's like somebody in your office walking by and saying hello. Mm -hmm. We're not going to not respond. Mm -hmm. You know, to not respond to a hotel, to a hello is about as rude as we can be, and we're not going to do that. But we do it all the time in the church. We just let it go by us. Mm -hmm. Well, as 